Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this dialogue session with Mr. Lee. As you know, Mr. Lee needs no introduction. He's one of the greatest living statesmen of our era. However, as some of you have come from very distant shores, I thought I'd make three quick points about Mr. Lee. Firstly, Mr. Lee was Prime Minister from 1959 to 1990. Subsequently, he stayed on the Cabinet as Senior Minister and then Minister Mentor. He inherited a struggling third world state. By the time he stepped down, it became a first world state. All this, as you know, has been documented in his book, From Third World to First, the Singapore Story. And as Kofi Annan has said, few have achieved what Mr. Lee has achieved in nation building. Secondly, whenever I travel around the world and meet from time to time leaders like President H.W. Bush, Prime Minister Tony Blair, they're always full of praise for Mr. Lee, both publicly and privately, and they say that he's one of the greatest statesmen he has encountered. Thirdly, Mr. Lee is not just a good nation builder and an international statesman. He's also one of the most reflective thinkers that we have on the world stage, and this is why, Mr. Lee, we were truly distinguished, we were truly happy that you accepted the invitation to be a distinguished fellow at our school. Uh, with that, I will begin by posing the first question to Mr. Lee, and then I hope you're all ready uh, with your questions, subsequent questions, because you'll be happy to have uh, a good discussion with you. And Mr. Lee, I was going to begin by saying that the South Asian diaspora has clearly come a long way the initial waves of migrants from South Asia were essentially from the lower classes. My father, for example, came to Singapore as a peon uh, in the 1930s and worked for five cents a day. In recent years, much more talented South Asians have migrated overseas. Hence, you have successful entrepreneurs that have been mentioned here, Lakshmi Mittal, prominent CEOs like Indra Nui of PepsiCo and Vikram Pandit of Citibank, as well as the deans of business schools of Harvard, NCR, and Chicago. So the question I was going to ask you, Mr. Lee, is with the enormous success of South Asians all around the world, how do you think this community can now help to contribute to the successful development uh, of South Asia? And as these countries reform and grow, what role will the diaspora play in their economic growth and development? It's a very difficult question to answer. <clears throat> Theoretically, say a fraction of... Uh, the population of India who have been abroad, who have the energy, who have the vitality, the organizational skills, can make a vast impact on India. But India is a very big mass of people of different languages and different nationalities. And therefore, it's difficult to make a total impact on a whole body politic. I mean, you can get a person from the Punjab appealing to the Punjabis, but not to the Madrasi. But nevertheless, I think if you can spread these people out into their various states and various cultural groups, they can bring about a mindset change. It's not easy, it's very difficult because India is set in its ways in old society and uh, not prone to sharp changes. So any changes would be like a big tanker taking a U-turn. So that being said, I think nevertheless if the Indian diaspora is determined as a group to organize themselves and make a difference to India, I think they can. Mr. Lee, besides India, there are participants from Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka and elsewhere. Do you think they can help the rest of South Asia too? Or bring India and Pakistan together? <laughs> <laughs> that was a question that was asked. <laughs> I uh, agree Indians and Pakistanis may lose some of the antagonisms that they feel for each other in their respective countries. 
but I don't think they can change the basic uh, grievances, whether real or imaginary, that the Pakistani and the Indian feel for each other. I'll take time. Okay, now I'm happy to acknowledge questions from the floor. Please uh, stand up and uh, a mic will be given to you. Identify yourself quickly. Please, Professor Muni. Yeah. Thank you. If you don't mind, identify yourself for Mr. Lee. <laughs> yes, yes, sir. Uh, honorable sir, uh, in the last couple of years, uh, we see a mild but a fresh stir of uh, democracy in Southeast Asia. We saw the so-called jasmine fragrance in China. The Myanmar generals had to shed off their uniform. Uh, we have now seen the corner ch uh, turn in, in Thailand and uh, to some extent also in Singapore. Would you reflect on this? And if the Southeast Asian countries really open up in terms of full blossom democracies, would it be as messy as in South Asia? <laughs> I am not uh, enamored of the idea that if you have uh, infection from one democracy to another, you are necessarily going to a better Southeast Asia. First, I think Southeast Asia is diverse. Each country has its own history, its own cultural and uh, economic problems. And they are not comparable. They are each so generous. Therefore, I do not believe that democracy is a solution for all these problems. It may be good. It may satisfy the purists, but I think what is required is good governance, eradication of corruption, economic development, that's what's going to make the difference.